The Columbia Network takes pride in presenting Orson Welles in the first production of a unique new summer series by the Mercury Theater on the Air. single year, the first in the life of the Mercury Theater, Orson Welles has come to be the most famous name of our time in American drama. Says Collier's Magazine, 23-year-old Orson Welles threw a bombshell into Broadway. Robert Benchley writes in The New Yorker, The production of the Mercury is, I should say, just about perfect. Time Magazine declares, The brightest moon that has risen over Broadway in years. Welles should feel at home in the sky. For the sky is the only limit which his ambitions recognize. And finally, the United Press remarks... The meteoric rise of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater continues unabated. With four hit shows in its first year, the Mercury might well close its door on a season unparalleled in Broadway history. But Mr. Welles has long been working on a project for a greater audience. The Broadways of the entire United States. The Columbia Network is proud to give Orson Welles the opportunity to bring to the air those same qualities of vitality and imagination that have made him the most talked-of theatrical director in America today. And it is this project which Columbia brings you this summer, the first time in its history that radio has ever extended such an invitation to an entire theatrical institution. But here is Orson Welles himself to tell you about it. The director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these programs, Orson Welles. Good evening. The Mercury Theater faces tonight a challenge and an opportunity for which we are grateful. We will present during the next nine weeks many different kinds of stories. Stories of romance and adventure, biography, mystery, and human emotion. Stories by authors like Robert Louis Stevenson, Emil Zola, Dostoevsky, Edgar Allan Poe, and P.G. Wodehouse. In the cast tonight are Martin Gable the Cassius of our production of Julius Caesar, and George Kouloris, who played Antony in that production and appeared also in our Shoemaker's Holiday and Heartbreak House, and other leading Mercury Theater players. We're starting off tonight with the best story of its kind ever written. You will find it in every representative library of classic English narrative. It is Bram Stoker's Dracula. The next time I speak to you, I am Dr. Arthur Seward, George Kouloris plays Jonathan Harker, and Martin Gable plays Dr. Van Helsing. It is Dr. Seward who tells the story, and so for the moment, goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you in Transylvania. The Mercury Theater on the Air presents Orson Welles as Count Dracula in his own version of Bram Stoker's great novel, Dracula. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Seward. I'm here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events which you may find it hard to believe, but I ask you to believe them. I have here certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of contemporary belief may stand forth as simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Harker. I, Jonathan Harker, lawyer's clerk, article to Peter Hawkins, Esquire of Exeter, England, am writing this journal in the hope that if misfortune overtakes me, it may one day come to the eyes of those who love me. 
I set out from London on the last day of April to visit one of our clients in Eastern Europe. On May the 3rd, I arrived in Budapest and came after nightfall to Klausenburg on the borders of Transylvania. At Bistritz, there was a letter of welcome for me from our client, informing me that his carriage would await me at the Borgo Pass. It was signed, Dracula. Bukovina! Couch for Bukovina! The road was rough, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers. They kept speaking to the driver and looking at me and urging him on to greater speed. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather string. The mountains seemed to come nearer to us on either side. Coachman! Coachman! What is it? Where are we? You are nearing your destination, young pair. This is the Borga Pass. There were black, rolling clouds overhead. And in the air, the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. Now, we were through the pass. The young hare is not expected after all. You are early tonight, my friend. A calèche with four horses are drawn up beside us. Let me help you, sir. The coachman smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. We began to move. I looked back. The coach and its load of passengers had vanished from sight. We swept into the darkness of the pass. I struck a match. It was within a few minutes of midnight. And then... A dog began to howl somewhere far down the road. The wind was rising, moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees flashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall. The baying of wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though, as though they were closing round us on every side. We kept on ascending, always ascending. The howling of wolves was growing less. Presently... It ceased altogether. And just then, the moon broke through the black clouds, and by its light, I, I saw around us a ring of wolves running alongside the carriage, in silence, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinuated limbs and shaggy hair. Welcome to my house. I must have fallen asleep. The carriage had pulled up in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle. The coachman was nowhere to be seen. Welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. His face was strong, very strong, aquiline. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. Mm. You hear me, Mr. Harker? The wolf? The children of the night, as you say, Mr. Harker. The wolves. Listen. Mm, come now. There are many things you must tell me tomorrow. Of England and of the estate there you have purchased for me. Ah, uh, yes. The estate is called Carfax, I believe. Yes, that is so. But now I will detain you no longer. You will find your room in readiness. And I advise you not to leave it. During the night. This castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. I explored. There are doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all of them locked. 
The door to the great hall, the door to the courtyard, every door in the castle is closed, bolted against me. The castle of Dracula is a prison, and I am a prisoner. The next night, I couldn't sleep. So after a few hours, I got up and lighting my candle, I faced my shaving mirror on the dressing table and was just beginning to shave. You seem restless, Mr. Harker. I hadn't seen him, although the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. I turned to the glass again. Count Dracula was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. It was blank. I started and cut myself on the side of the throat. The blood was trickling down my neck. Ah! Count, my mirror! The blood! The blood! Wipe the blood from your face, Mr. Harker. And take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. When I awoke, I found most of my things were gone. My passport, my notes, my letter of credit. I could find no trace of them anywhere. And my door is locked from the outside. June 20th. There is work of some kind going on in the castle. Now and then, I hear the faraway muffled sound of matter and spades. And last night, the second of the predated letters which Dracula made me write, the second of that series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth went forth. <laughs> Count Dracula. Yes, my young friend. Well, what of me? When am I free? When can I leave this place? Free? Mr. Harker, you're always free. You want to leave? Would you like to leave tonight? Yes, yes, in God's name. My dear young friend, not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Come, follow me. Hmm, the door seems to be bolted half plain. The door is locked. Well, in God's name, open it. As you will, Mr. Harker. You English have a proverb which is very close to my heart. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Good night, Mr. Harker. Shut the door! Shut the door! I said you shut the door! Shut! The door is shut, Mr. Harker. I take it. You will remain. Morning, June the 30th. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. Oh, God preserve my sanity. I have never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock crow, he is gone. I... I do not understand these things. I only know that the wolves obey him, and that he is a man with hair on the palm of his hands, with sharp teeth, and no blood in his face. He casts no shadow. He cannot be seen in a glass. And he moves like a bat across the sheer face of the castle walls. He eats no food, and is mortally afraid of the crucifix. As I write this, I hear in the courtyard the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. And there is in the passageway below a sound of heavy boxes being set down. Boxes shaped like coffins. And I know what they hold. Boxes are filled with holy earth from the chapel beneath the castle. It is the last box being nailed down. Now I hear the heavy feet tramping again. The door shut. The chains rattle. In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips. Help! 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 The wagons have gone. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Seward. Mr. Harker's journal terminates at this point. 
I now present in evidence the clipping dated August 8th of that year from the Yorkshire Telegraph from our correspondent in Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record is experienced here today. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but Saturday evening was fine. The band was playing. The piers were crowded with holiday makers. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and there was a dead calm. There were but few lights at sea. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner under full canvas, which was seemingly going westward. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. And there, with all sails set, was the foreign schooner rushing with terrific speed toward the shore. A searchlight was turned on her. And there, lashed to the helm, was a corpse. With drooping head, which swayed horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. A moment later, she crashed. And then a strange thing was seen. At the very instant she touched, a huge dog sprang up on deck from below and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand and making straight up the east cliff toward the graveyard, vanished into the night. The coast guard, going aboard at dawn, found the dead man fastened to a spoke of the wheel. Tightly clutched in one hand was a crucifix. The man must have been dead for quite two days. In the pocket of the dead man's coat was found a bottle, carefully corked, containing a roll of paper. This proved to be an addendum to the ship's log. There was found on board only a small amount of cargo and that of a most unusual nature. Apparently the ship carried nothing but earth. Common earth. Packed away in wooden boxes. Shaped much like coffins. of the Demeter. Russian flag, Black Sea, to Whitby. July 6th. Finished taking in cargo, a queer cargo, boxes of earth. At noon, set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, four hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain. July 11th. Entered Bosporus. At dark, passed through Dardanelle. Mate reported in morning that one of crew, Valyodin, was missing. Took Larbert watch eight bells last night. He was relieved by Chilean. You know, came to his bunk. There's something aboard oh. the ship. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't laugh, Captain. In the rain last night. Oh. A tall, thin man go up companion way and along the deck forward and disappeared. When I go to the bow, no one. And the hatchways all closed. July 22nd. Rough weather last three days. All hands busy with sails. No time be frightened. Past Gibraltar and out through Strait. All well, July 24th. Last night, another hand was lost. Disappeared. By Kalichis. Leave off watch midnight. Then we never see him again. Double watch now. If I don't watch. take watch alone no more. Double watch. Double watch. July 29th. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning comes... Hey! Hey, Milo! Where is he? Where is he? He's where is he, Milo? Where is he? He's gone! Oh, where is he? He's gone like the us. Like all the us. The mate and I have agreed to go armed henceforth, July 30th. Last night, we are nearing England. Weather fine. All sails set. Captain! Captain! The man in the watching is there for meeting! Most meeting! Now, only self and mate and one hand left to work ship. August 3rd. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at wheel. And when I got to it, found no one there. It's here. I know it now. I saw it. Like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows looking out. I gave it the knife and my knife went through it. What? Empty as air. What is it? What are you talking about? It's here. And I'll find it. It's in the hold in one of those boxes of earth. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. And see. He is mad. 
Dark raving mad. It's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as common earth. <laughs> He's there, down in the hole. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. August 4th. I am all alone on my ship. And still the fog... I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed. And in the dimness of the night, I saw it. I saw him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a sailor in the blue water. But I am captain... And I must not leave my ship. I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them I shall tie that which it dare not touch. My crucifix. I am growing weaker. And the night is coming on. God and the Blessed Virgin help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. You are listening to the Columbia Network's first presentation in a new summer series of unique dramatic productions featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. In just a moment, our story of Bram Stoker's Dracula will continue. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue now with Columbia Network's presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in Dracula. Telegram, keyword, perfect, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Lucy was tenra in alarming condition. Cannot diagnose. Come at once. Seward. Telegram. When helping Amsterdam to show us perfectly. I'm on my way to you. Please arrange the examination patient immediately my arrival from Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, I must now explain that six months before the events recorded here, I had become engaged to a young lady, Lucy Westenra. We were to have been married in the spring. My old teacher, Professor Van Helsing, arrived at four the next afternoon. I took him at once to Lucy's house. She lay in a bed asleep. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums. And the bones of her face stood out. Young miss is bad. Very bad. She must have blood or she will die. Yet she is not anemic. The qualitative analysis of her blood gives quite normal condition. It is strange... I do not like to think how strange. Look! My God, her throat, look! The black velvet band that she always wore had dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Just over the external jugular vein were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. The edges were white and worn looking. Well? Well, what is it, Professor? What's wrong with her? Speak frankly, you can tell me the worst. I wish I could, Stuart. I wish I could. But I do not dare. But won't you tell me any, anything? I will tell you this. Your young lady is in a danger greater than death. You must believe me. If you leave her for one moment and harm befalls, you will not sleep easy thereafter. September 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. Arthur, I'm afraid. My dear, you can sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. Nothing can happen. And I promise if any sign of bad dreams, if I see anything, I'll wake you at once. You will? Will you really? 
In our sleep. I sat all night by her bedside. And she did not wake once during the night, although her bows or a bat or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. September 11th. Still quoting from my private journals. It was this time that I received a message from Perfleet. Read 10.20 p.m. St. John's Hospital, serious complications, case 891, your immediate presence, London, imperative. I had no choice. Sometime later, a paper was found among Lucy Westenra's belongings. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the window was closed. The doctor Van Helsing had directed. But... Two in the morning, I awakened. I went to the door, called out. Arthur! Arthur! There was no answer. <laughs> Something's broken the window. I'm in the room, alone. I dare not go out. The house seems empty. The air is full of specks, floating. Circling in the draft from the window. And the light burns blue. Dim. What am I to do? Something very sweet and very bitter all around me. Nothing sinking into deep water. And there's singing in my ears. You shall be fresh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Ah. September 12th. Late. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. We found her sprawled on the floor. There was a draft in the room from the broken window. Her throat was bare, showing the two wounds, looking horribly white and mangled. We are too late, my friend. We have failed. God's will be done. She's dying. Yes. She's dying. Stay beside her. It will make much difference, mark me. Whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. It was late in the afternoon before she opened her eyes. Oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. I took her hand and knelt beside her. Her breath came and went like a tired, peaceful child. And then the light from the setting sun fell on her face, and then, insensibly, a strange change came over her. Her eyes grew suddenly dull and hard. Her breathing was heavy. The mouth opened and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look large and sharp. Arthur, oh, my love. I'm glad you've come. Kiss me. Bend down and kiss me. Not for your life. Not for your living soul and hers. <laughs> Lucy! She's dead. Poor girl. There's peace for at last. The end. Not so. It is only the beginning. Wait and see. Westminster Gazette, September 25th. A Hempstead mystery. The Kensington Horror, the stabbing woman, and the woman in black are vividly recalled to mind by a series of events that have taken place recently in the neighborhood of Hempstead. Several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or failing to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children have given us their excuse that they have been with a beautiful lady who offered them chocolate. In each case, the child was found to be slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seemed such as might be made by a rat or a small dog. The 
attempts at her. Another child injured by the beautiful lady. He has just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning. It has the same tiny wound in throat. Well, Stuart, what do you think of that? You mean to tell me, my friend, that you still have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Nervous prostration, following great loss and waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? You are a clever man, my friend, and a good doctor. But you do not believe that there are things that you cannot understand. You are wrong, Stuart. Are you aware of all the mysteries of life and death? Can you tell me why in the pampas there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry those veins? Hmm? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on trees all day and then when the sailors sleep on deck because it is hot, flit down on them and then in the morning are found dead men as white as Miss Lucy was? I understand none of these things. After tonight, Stuart, if you dare to come with me, perhaps then you will understand. September 29th. Before dawn. Now it is done. And I would sooner die a thousand deaths than live again through what I did this night. We will spend the night, you and I, here in this churchyard where Miss Lucy is buried. We enter the tomb. Then we open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. Take care, Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she is not dead, with some difficulty, we found the West End tomb. I took up my place behind a yew tree. On one side of the tomb, Van Helsing on the other. Killed and frightened. Suddenly, I saw something moving between two yew trees. A dim, white figure which held something at its breast. The figure stopped. I could not see the face, for it was bent down over what I saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep. Or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. Then the thing saw us. She drew back with an angry snarl. The lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square. If ever a face meant death, I saw it at that moment. Then suddenly she turned and vanished in the direction of the tomb. Child is not harmed. We leave him in a safe place where the police find him. There's more to do. Come. Now we were in the tomb. Then in the coffin. The thing lay... Like a nightmare of Lucy, the pointed teeth, a blood-stained mouth. Van Helsing never looked up. From his bag, he took out a book, his operating knives, a heavy hammer, and a round wooden stake, some two or three inches thick, sharpened to a fine point, and hardened over a fire. Do it! The life of this unhappy woman is just begun. When she become what you call undead, there comes with the change the curse of immortality. She cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims. Because all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on others. So the circle goes on, ever widening as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. But if this lady, this undead, be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall be again free. Tell me, what am I to do? Take this stake in your left hand, the hammer in your right. Yes. Place the point over the heart. Yes. Then, when I begin the prayer for the dead, in God's name, strike. <laughs> Are you ready? Now. Domine Jesu Christe, Fili de Vivi, qui manus tuas ex voluntate patri. On the morning of July 11th, a man was found on the border of Transylvania. He talked wildly of wolves, 
and boxes of earth and blood. He gave his name as Jonathan Harker. In the hospital at Clausenburg, he improved sufficiently to make possible his removal to England. I'm still quoting from my own personal papers. But there his condition remained so serious that he was committed for observation to a private ward in my hospital at Percy. Here he did so well that in three weeks he was completely recovered. It was during this time that his wife, Minna Harker, brought to the attention of Dr. Van Helsing and myself the journal that her husband had kept while a prisoner in the castle of a certain Count Dracula in Transylvania. I have before me the record of a meeting that took place in my study in Perthleet, transcribed by Mina Harker. October 1st. Meeting began soon after 8. Jonathan next to me. Dr. Seward opposite to Van Helsing at the head of the table. My friend, there are such things as vampires. Had I known at first what now I know, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who love her. The vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong that he can direct all the elements. The storm, the flood, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the moth and bat, the owl and the fox and the wolf. How then... Are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his place? And having found it, how can we destroy him? My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake. To fail here is not mere life or death. If we fail, we become as him. Foul things of the night, as him. What do you say? I answer for myself. Count me in. I'm with you. The professor laid a small golden crucifix on the table. We took hands and our solemn pact was made. My friends, we too are not without strength. The vampire flourishes on the blood of the living. Without this he cannot live. He throws no shadow. He makes no reflection in a mirror. He can transform himself to a wolf, to a bat. He can come on moonlight rays as elemental dust. He can see in the dark. He can do all these things. Yet he is not free. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then, until night, he must remain in the shape in which he finds himself. And except in his coffin home... In those earth boxes, he cannot rest. When we can confine him in his coffin, then, my friends, if we obey what we know, we will destroy him. At that moment, something flapped wildly against the window, then. Did you hit it? I don't know. We looked out of the window. Against the black sky, we could see nothing. data in our position. From the Count's castle in Transylvania to Whitby came 50 boxes of earth. All of these, to our certain knowledge, were delivered at Carfax. Recently, 12 of these boxes have been removed. First step, ascertain whether all the rest remain in the deserted house next door or whether any more have been removed. We must trace each of these boxes and sterilize the earth with holy water so that he can no longer seek safety in it. And we must hurry. The events of the next few days were described in Jonathan Harker's journal. October 2nd, 5 a.m. Just returned from the empty house. Left Mina here at home. Well, we've done our work at Carfax. The place was filthy. The air stagnant and foul and alive with rats. We counted the boxes. Only 38 of them. And over each one, the professor went through his same mysterious work. It was dawn when we got back. I found Mina asleep. She looks... Paler than usual. October 2nd. Soon after they left, I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs. And then there was silence. I got up and looked out of the window. There was a thin streak of white mist moving across the grass along the wall of the house. It dawned on me that the air in the room was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark through the fog. I could see through my eyelids. The mist grew thicker and thicker. Then, 
as I looked. The spark divided and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes. You shall be flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, blood of my blood. October 2nd, 8 p.m. We're on the track. Twelve boxes were delivered last week to an empty house at 347 Piccadilly. My dear friend, until the sun sets tonight, Dracula must retain whatever form he now has. We have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. Then he will have no place where he can move and hide. But we have only until sunset. The house in Piccadilly was empty. Like the one at Percy, the same sickening smell was in the air. On the table, we found a clothes brush, a brush, and a comb, and a basin. The latter containing dirty water, which was reddened as if with blood. The boxes are back here. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Only eleven. There's a twelfth box somewhere. Gentlemen, it is after six. The sun is setting. We've no time to lose. He will return at any moment. Open the boxes. <laughs> Quiet. Listen. Here it is. It is he! The window! You waste your bullet, gentlemen. You think you baffle me? You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. The time is on my side. The one you love is mine already. I have known her. Already my mark is on her throat. Flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. She is with me always, over land or sea. October 4th morning, another meeting in the study of Turkey. We must find that last remaining box, gentlemen. We must find it. As long as that earth exists in pure, as long as there remains one place of refuge for Dracula, there is no safety and no peace for any soul in England. And for the undead, never peace so long as he lives. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. Mina! How do you know that? Oh, well, quiet, you... quiet. With me. With me always. Over land and sea. Mina, darling, how did you know that Dracula said those... I don't know. The word just came. Strange. There are times when somehow I feel that I'm with him. At sunset? Yes. Just at sunset. And again at sunrise. Dr. Van Helsing, if I could. If at that time, you... Have you the courage? Courage for what? What do you mean? Dr. Van Helsing here will question her. I will question her, yes. In a state of hypnosis. The one you love is already mine, he said. She is with me always, over land or sea. Ah, Count Dracula. Perhaps she will betray you if she is really with you, this one we love. Who knows? If she is really with you, over land or sea. Blood of my blood. Mina. Yes? Answer me, Mina. Are you with him? Yes, I am with him. Where are you? I do not know. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear it on the outside. Then you are on a ship. Yes. What else do you hear? There is the creaking of an anchor chain. What are you doing? 
report from Matt and Peabody. Ship brokers. Dated October 5th, according to Lloyd's List, the only sailing ship that left for the Black Sea yesterday was the Tsarina Katrina, bound for Varna. Some hours before she sailed, a man came alongside, all in black, driving a cart with a great box in it. This he lifted down single-handed and carried below. No one remembers having seen him after that as heavy mist came up over Doolittle Dock until sailing time. The rest of London Harbor remained completely clear. Our plans are made. The average sailing time from London to the Black Sea is three weeks. We can travel overland to the same place in three days. We shall be there waiting for him when he arrives. October 15th, arrive Barn about five o'clock. Mina seems stronger. Every morning before sunrise and just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing in a trance. Are you with him, Mina? Tell me, are you with him? I am with him. What can you see? Nothing. All is dark. What can you hear? I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. So, Zarina Katrina is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. The Count cannot cross warning water. So we cannot leave the ship without being observed. What do you hear, Mina? Happy way. I'm rushing to water. Darkness. Darkness and wind. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams from Lloyd. Not yet reported. 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 Rushing water and creaking mud. Darkness. Darkness and wind. October 24th. Telegram. Lloyd, London, to Harker. Sarina Katrina reported this morning from Dardanelles. Lloyd, London to Harker, October 28th. Sarina Katrina in heavy fog reported entering Galat's Harbor at 1 o'clock today. Galat! Galat is 38 hours from here, and the first train for Galat leaves at 6 30 tomorrow morning. My friends, we have lost. <laughs> Bucharest, we are three hours late. Come aboard with an order an hour before sunup. Receive a box for a party by the name of Dracula. That is Pepper's a uh, Emmanuel Hillsheim, his name was. Mr. Hiddleshan? Yes. You unloaded the box yesterday. I gave it to Kyloff by order. Kyloff. Mr. Kyloff? Kyloff. This morning they find him dead inside the churchyard of St. Peter. They find him dead. With his throat torn open. October 30th, evening. There are two ways in which Dracula can get back to his own place. By land or by water. We've examined the map and find the most likely river is the Ceres. You and I, see what will charter a steam launch and follow him up the river. Van Helsing and Mina will take the train to Veresti, and from there they from will... From there, we shall go in the track where Harker is went, from Bistrit over to Borgo. If you have not caught him before, we shall be awaiting Dracula there. <laughs> October 31st, we arrived at the rest at noon, then Helsing and I. Bought a carriage here, and we start in an hour. Our enemy is still on the river. 
October 31st. We can run at good speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water and the banks are wide apart. November 1st, evening. No news all day. We hear that a big boat went up the river before us, going at more than usual speed. November 4th. All day driving. The country gets wilder as we go. By morning, we shall reach the Borgo Pass. November the 4th, evening. We've left the launch. We've got horses, and we follow on the track along the river. We are armed. Look! Quick! There they are now! Heading west! With the dawn, we could see the Slovaks some miles before us, dashing along the river with their wagons. On it is the great box. Afternoon. We reached the Burgo Pass. Fantastic! Look! Look! We could see a long way all around us. Far off, beyond the white waste of snow, was the river like a black ribbon curling. Between us and the river, not afar off, came a group of men, mounted Slovaks, hurrying along. In the midst of them was a wagon which swept from side to side. On the wagon was a great box. Look! We see two horses following fast, coming up from the south. Stuart and Parker. The Slovaks with their heavy wagons are losing their guard. Now the horsemen are not more than a mile behind. Now the wagon is quite close to us. We can see the grey box swaying gravely. Now they are almost upon us. Now has happened a strange thing. The wagon smashed into a great rock dead in the snow, lost its front wheels, and turned over on its side, jammed against the stone. The horses tore loose from their traces and bolted, and the Slovaks scatter and vanish after them. Then silence. Silence like comes uh, after ringing a bell. Look, his face. It is Dracula, sprawled out stiff and twisted in the smear of his own holy earth. The bucks, in falling, has emptied the dirt onto the snow. His face is old-looking. The skin is like paper. Dr. Seward, there's no time. Look at the sun. Sunset. In one minute there is darkness and he is forever lost to us. Have you the stake of wood and the hammer? Yes. Now, Seward, pray for us. Kneel down and pray. Harker, the stake of wood over his heart. Be not afraid, Harker. Do not look into his eyes. The hammer. Now, Harker, strike. Strike. Flesh. Flesh of my flesh. Guilt of my guilt. Death of my death. Speak and be manifest in the instant of your master's peril. Elements of darkness. Rain, evil wind, mist, and mold, and tempest. Strike! The others couldn't, but somehow I can hear him speaking behind his eyes. Claw, wing, tooth, scale, tissue of flesh, death of my death. Dead and undead. The hand of the living is over your master. Console him, my children. This instant is no longer than the space between two heartbeats. But the night is not here. And I am lonely. Come to your master, my children. Beguile him now in the instant of his peril. Beguile him with the sound of your names. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Tissue of flesh. Strike! Hark a strike! There is one very dear to me who has not answered. My love. Mina. There is less than a minute between me and the night. You must speak for me. You must speak with my art. Give them to me! 
Jonathan, give them to me. They're sick and put in the hammer. Harker! I shall never forget that moment. The look on poor Mina's face as she stood there, the angry scar standing out on her throat, her eyes like living coals in the last red of the sunset. She had torn the stake and the hammer out of my hands with the strength of an animal. Mina, do you know what you've done, woman? Do you know what you've done to us? You've released him. The evil is free. Look! The sun! As we looked down at Dracula, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the hate in them turned to triumph. Flesh. Of my flesh, come to me, my love. Come into the night and the darkness. You have served me well, my love. My bride, my... Ladies and gentlemen, all the evidence in this case is now before you. I've added nothing, and to the best of my knowledge, I've omitted nothing that might help to throw light on the extraordinary events of the year 1891, which culminated on that terrible evening in the Borgo Pass. There remains only this one last report. When Mina Harker seized the stake and hammer from her husband, I believe she was under some form of hypnosis. She herself remembers nothing. But whatever influence was at work on her, she must, at the last moment, have rejected it. For at the exact instant the sun disappeared, it was Mina Harker who drove the stake through the heart of the thing that called itself Dracula. At that same instant, even as we looked... The wound on the side of her throat was no more. As for Dracula, before the scream of the creature had died from our ears, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In that final moment of dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. <laughs> Tonight's production of Dracula by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater was the first of nine CBS broadcasts in which this brilliant group will bring to life a series of great narratives, all presented in the immediacy of the first-person singular. In presenting them each Monday evening at this time during the summer season, the Columbia Network is bringing a complete theatrical producing company to the air for the first time. In the cast tonight, Dr. Van Helsing was played by Martin Gable, Jonathan Harker by George Kolouris, Dr. Seward by Orson Welles, the Russian captain by Ray Collins, the mate by Carl Swenson, Mina Harker by Agnes Moorhead, Lucy Westenra by Elizabeth Farrow, and Count Dracula by Orson Welles. Bernard Herman composed the original music and conducted. Dan Seymour speaking. Davidson Taylor supervised the production for the Columbia Network. And now here is the director to tell you about next week's Mercury Theater production, Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your favorite stories? If there is one you're particularly fond of and would like to hear on the air, will you please write me about it? Next week, the Mercury Theater is going to tell you Robert Louis Stevenson's exciting yarn about pirates and the sea, Treasure Island. Until then, just in case Count Dracula's left you a little apprehensive, one word of comfort. When you go to bed tonight, don't worry. Put out the lights and go to sleep. Be oh. It's all right. You can rest peacefully. That's just a sound effect. There. Over there in the shadow. See? It's nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I think it's nothing. But always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are wolves. There are vampires. Such things do exist.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Restless sea, we are met to call from out of the past stories, strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so that all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, Frankenstein. The wind howling outside my lonely home is my only companion. All else is quiet here as I sit by my window in the parlor writing this document for the scientific world. Be warned, you doctors and scientists who come after me. Be warned that man must not experiment with the secrets of life. My experiences started in the University of Manchester, where I was studying natural history. It was after class, May 22nd, 1818, that Professor Waldman, my close dear friend Henry Clerval and myself were in the laboratory of the university. Victor Frankenstein, your persistence amazes me. Someday I shall sit at your feet and allow you to teach me. Thank you, Professor Warman. But the whole subject of the structure of man has always been too clouded in mysticism. Well, frankly, Victor, I prefer mysticism. Well, that's because you're a mystic, Henry. Why, Henry's no more a mystic than I am. He just loves to avoid arduous work. Oh, translating that means I'm lazy, eh, Professor? Well, if you prefer to put it that way, I rather think of you as a student whose nervous structure does not take kindly to natural history. <laughs> the professor is kinder to you than you are to yourself, Henry. Well, if I worked as hard as you do, Victor, I should probably wear that same gaunt, sleepless look that you carry about. Well, my experiment will be finished tonight. And then I'll manage the eight hours sleep that other men manage. The secret experiment will be finished tonight, huh? Well, then, will you tell us just exactly what you're doing in the basement at home? I'll tell the entire world. As a matter of fact, I, I stayed after class this afternoon, Professor Waldman, to ask you to join me this evening in the basement of our place to watch the completion of my work. Oh, well, how about me? I don't think I dare invite more than one, Henry. And the professor is more interested in this type of procedure than, than you are. I shall be delighted, Victor. Just the best friend who never knows what's going on in his own home, that's all. It's not that, Henry. But I thought you'd entertain Elizabeth for me, while the professor and I were at work. Entertaining Elizabeth would be a delightful favor, old boy. You know, I think you trust me too much with her. Have you ever met Victor's fiancée, Professor Waldman? She's one of the most charming... Yes, Elizabeth was one of the most charming, beautiful women I'd ever known. I had been in love with her from childhood, but even my love for Elizabeth couldn't dim my passionate zeal for the work I was doing. It was eight o'clock that evening. Henry, Elizabeth, and I were seated in the parlor. Elizabeth was saying... I'll be so glad, Victor, darling, when all this is over. If you only knew how tired you look. The minute my work is done, successfully or unsuccessfully, I promise you, Elizabeth, we'll be married and, and off to Switzerland before Henry has time to lock up this place. But first, we find out about the secret in the basement. Henry's being eaten up by curiosity. I don't blame him. I'm suffering pangs of what's it all about, too. Well, you'll both know soon. 
I wonder where Professor Wallman is. He's late. He'll be here soon, Victor. Stop pacing the floor, sweetheart. I think I'll start my work downstairs. Send the professor down when he arrives, will you, darling? We'll come down ourselves and take a look around. Or will I turn into a pillar of salt for peeking? Nobody ever turned into a pillar of salt for peeking, Beth. It was for looking back. Oh, nothing like a good practical working knowledge of the Bible for scientific experiments. <laughs> Starts the night off right. Yes, I thought jokingly of that paragraph from the Bible then. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. But what about a man who looks back? There is no ready reference for him or for me. I went downstairs to my laboratory at a little past eight, opened the door, and started to tinker around to pass the time more quickly. My every sense was alive, taut, waiting, with the sense of what was to come. I heard a knock on the side door, which led me from my laboratory directly into the forest, which bordered Manchester. I looked out and... Good evening, Victor. Oh, did Elizabeth tell you to come down this way, Professor? No, I found the entrance to your laboratory quite by myself. Can I help you with your coat, sir? No, 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 you proceed with your work. Nothing like trivialities to annoy a scientist at work. <sighs> there we are. Oh, follow me, Professor, into the back room, and you'll see for yourself what this is all about. Well, I feel that I'm in for a most exhilarating evening. I wish I had more students fashioned in your mold, Victor. Well, Professor, here is my... Why... What's this? A full-sized replica of a man. Yes. Only he isn't full-sized. He's fashioned on a grander scale. I should say this creature standing up would be approximately eight feet two inches tall. Well, you should have been an artist, Victor. He's a perfect reproduction. What did you make him out of? Wood? Clay? Animal flesh. Flesh? Feel him. Oh, feels like the body of a dead man. Or the body of a man who hasn't as yet been brought to life. This body is complete in every detail. Heart, lungs, teeth. Even the fine nervous system. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, interesting. How about the brain cells? Yes, adult brain cells. I think he's quite handsome, don't you? Well, each man to his own taste. He's the best reproduction of a man I've ever seen. But actually, his face is hideous. As a plastic surgeon, my dear Victor, I'm afraid I can't give you much credit. Well, what do you intend to do with this hulk? You see this fluid here in the test tube? Yes. I fill the hypodermic needle with it. And now, now I'm going to inject the full eight ounces into the vein, directly above his heart. But why? Watch. You see, Professor, quite by accident, I stumbled on the secret of life. I've been bringing small, one-celled creatures to life for quite some time. The secret of life? Within 30 seconds, after this injection, this creature will live. You're trying to play God, Victor. It's heresy. It's science. I'm making a new race, by far finer than the present one. Larger in structure, stronger, heavier, healthier. A race able to live on nuts and berries with a greater capacity for feeling. Victor, for the love of heaven, don't go through with this experiment. No man living has the right to tamper with the secret of life. You've created a monster on that floor. You've no idea what will happen if you go through with this. Watch, Professor. The injection. I only hope and pray this is a failure. It can't be. His eyes moved. Watch him, Professor. He's like a baby, first realizing life. His hands touch the floor. His eyes are trying to focus on the world around him. He's hideous. Yes, he's hideous. I made the skin too much like parchment, I'm afraid. Victor, get rid of that monster. Uh, he's trying uh, to stand up. Uh, if that mind which you've created is a twisted one, have you any idea what kind of horror you've let loose in England? As a humanitarian, I feel it my Christian duty to do this now. Put that knife down, Professor. No, I can't let... Ooh! Oh, he's got me in the clutch of his hand. Command him to stop this, Victor. Stop fighting him, Professor. He's frightened. He has the same reactions as a child. Grabs and won't let loose. Let me go, monster. Stop! Don't go out that door. Put the Professor down. Don't go out that door. The monster left my laboratory through the side entrance into the forest, 
carrying the incredibly mangled body of the professor with him. I rushed out of my laboratory after him, but the creature was faster than I, and he disappeared from view. I returned to my laboratory and destroyed all evidence of the creature's manufacture. I burned the blueprints from which I had made his body. Then, carefully, I locked my laboratory and went upstairs to join Henry Clerval and Elizabeth. I must have looked wild-eyed as I entered the room. <laughs> Henry, that's most amusing. You tell the best anecdotes in all of England. Oh, you flatter me, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, Victor, you're through sooner than we expected. Uh, Darling, what's the matter? Didn't the professor show up? Nothing's the matter. My experiment was... was a failure. Oh. But the professor... He never showed up. Beth, Henry, I, I want to go away. Of course, darling, we will, as soon as Henry can get the house locked up. Uh, I don't want to wait. I want to leave at once, tonight, please, tonight, Beth. We can get married before we cross the channel and, and then go to Switzerland. But it's almost midnight now, darling. What's the difference? Please, Beth, if you love me. But why tonight, Victor? Henry, you've no idea what I've been through. I have to get away at once. Of course, darling, if you insist. Anything you want. And we'll be married before daylight. Darling, darling, Beth. I know a little minister whom we can awake. And so Beth and I were married that evening in a little chapel on the coast. Then the three of us fled to Bern, Switzerland. I refused to have anything to do with the civilized world. No newspapers, no word of home. Just the peace and quiet of the Swiss mountains. Henry and Elizabeth both tried to learn of the events which had occurred in my laboratory that evening. But I never broke my silence on that subject. After the first tries, they refrained from asking me about it again. It was in the middle of the fourth month of our visit when Henry and I were sitting on the terrace of the little house in the mountain. Beth was out picking berries when Henry suddenly... Victor. I'm your closest friend. I've tried to keep silent about... Well, Victor, the day after we left England, I bought a newspaper. Did you, Henry? Yes, I saw this clipping on the front page. I couldn't very well miss it. Well, what clipping? This one. The horribly mangled remains of Professor Waldman was found on Beekman Hill. The identity of the unknown murderer is being sought by Scotland Yard. Poor Professor Waldman, I... I'd no idea. Hadn't you? No. What are you trying to say to me, Henry? You're leaving England so suddenly that very night. Your fear of being discovered, the secret experiment. Well, it, it all seemed to add up to some, some kind of strange connection with this clipping. Now, if you're in trouble, Victor, you can depend on me. I'll stay by your side. I'm not in trouble. I'm just tired, terribly tired. And you know nothing of the professor? Absolutely nothing. He didn't come to our chateau that evening. I told you he didn't then. Stop questioning me. Victor! Victor! We're out here, Beth. Oh, I've just had a horrible experience. Oh, darling, I, I'm so glad to see you. You're pale, Beth. <laughs> Sit down right here next to me. Well, what happened, Beth? Well, I was, I was walking in the woods not far from here when I looked up and saw... Well, I saw a man... Sort of a man standing over me. Well, men aren't so bad. That is, if you happen to know the right ones. And you do. I, I'm not joshing, Henry. He wasn't exactly a man. He, he was twice the height of anyone I've ever seen. And his skin looked like dried parchment. It's, it's incredible, but I think I've seen a monster. A monster? Yes, I, I ran away. He didn't follow me. He just, just stared after me. Watching me. You do believe me, don't you? A monster stared after oh, look, you? Look, look, Henry. Victor, through the trees right out there. Look, there he is again. Yes, the monster stood there, silhouetted against the trees. The monster which I had created, standing like an evil glut of flesh and bone, moved in the darkening twilight, and then suddenly, phantom-like, it disappeared. Beth and Henry both watched me as I started from the piazza after the disappearing creature in the backwoods. As I drew near to the heavily wooded section, 
Giant footprints in the soft mud about me showed the path ahead. The sun was sinking in the west, and the last orange pinpoints of light needled my flesh until every sense within me was tingling with the expectations of seeing my living horror. Then I realized I was unarmed. Every crooked tree, each twisted branch which obstructed my path, appeared to be his form. I heard the crackling of a branch and the moving of a form on the velvet moss. I thought you'd come, Creator. You. Are you frightened, Creator? You dare talk to me. Please, don't turn away from me. Please. Let me go. I mean no harm to you. Listen to me, Victor Frankenstein. You must listen to me. You created me. You owe me that much. I owe you nothing, murderer. Why am I a murderer? Because you created a form so horrible, a face so distorted that no man can look upon me and call me friend. I'm an outcast. You can save me. Let me go. Not until you hear my story. Sit down, creator. My arm, let me go. I wandered through the streets of London that first day. Children screamed in the streets. People flocked together trying to kill me. And I was lonely and hungry. How did you follow me here? Not so long ago, I returned to my birthplace, the laboratory, broke in and discovered your identity. But first, I fled to Scotland and lived outside of a cottage. That's how I learned to speak. An old blind man was teaching a young French girl to speak English. I listened to the lessons from the open windows. Now, what do you expect of me? A companion, a woman of the same species with my defects. One who will be my friend. This, this being, you must create. No, I'll not do it. You must. Every man's entitled to a wife. No. You must. If you create her for me, I'll take her with me into the far wastes. And no one will ever see either of us again, ever. How will you live? On fruits and berries. We'll manage together. Please, you can't deny me this. A maid. A monster's maid. You will? You will? I swear, I'll never harm another human. Never create her. If you'll only grant me just one companion. And if I refuse? If you refuse, even a brain that you have made, creator, might become twisted and distorted. And so that night in the forest, I made a devil's bargain. I bargained to create a monster's mate, perhaps another murderer. How could I know? The monsters swore to live in the forest and wait. Wait a year or two years if necessary. And upon completion of my work, he would take his companion away. But if I broke my promise, he swore revenge. And so I started work. I searched Paris for the necessary equipment. Built a shack in the woods about a mile away from our chalet. Three months I worked, three solid months shaping her who was to be his mate. 
And then one night, it was windy outside. I thought the wind had blown the door open when... Victor! Victor, I'm sorry, I had to disturb you. Is it Beth? No, not Beth. She's fine and sends her love. It's the townspeople. Your activities have stirred up a lot of curiosity. Oh, the fools! Well, I can't blame them, especially after the rumors which have been going around. Rumors of the... Victor, you know the monster in these forests. You've known of him all along. People have seen him and connect him with you. Mothers in the village are frightened of their children. I know nothing. Look, I'm only trying to help you. I know nothing, I tell you. But the men have banded together. They're going to make a raid on you here. To burn your laboratory down. And to find the monster who lives in these woods. They can't. They mustn't. Oh, what devil's work are you carrying on, man? I'm trying to help you. Oh, Victor, will you please let your friends be your friends? Henry, go back to Beth and leave me alone. Beth is safe at home. You're in danger and I won't leave your side this night, my friend. Then be prepared. Prepared for what? You've guessed many of the reasons for my secrecy. Then there is a monster. At school, I stumbled on the secret of life. I was trying to create a superior race. I was a fool and I created him instead. And he does live? Yes, he lives. Professor Waldman, what happened to Professor Waldman? The night I created the monster, Waldman became frightened. He screamed, attempted to kill the creature. The creature, like a child, warded him off and and then tore him to pieces in front of me. I couldn't stop him. The monster had killed before it had really begun to live. Then what? The monster left the basement through the side entrance, carrying the professor's corpse. I had no choice. I had to leave the country. Oh, <laughs> what are you doing with that creature now? Fulfilling a promise. Follow me into my cabin and I'll show you. How soon do you think the townsfolk will be here? Oh, within two hours or so. They're meeting in the square in town. Come in. A woman. Yes, a woman. The monster's mate, his friend. I promised him a friend. And in return, he swears to hide himself forever from the world. A, a devil's bargain, Victor. A bargain I must keep for all our sakes. But the monster proved himself a murderer time and time again. Why, in London, after the death of Professor Waldman. Time and time again. But how do you know that the mate won't be even more vicious than he? You'll let loose an avalanche of hatred. Oh, destroy her before you bring her to life. Yes, avalanche of hatred. Look, you've no time to waste. Set fire to this cabin quickly, Victor. Set fire to the cabin and come away. What man alive, you can't go through with this thing. But the promise. It's a promise to a fiend. He'll be your death and ours, Victor. Oh, hurry, man, hurry, if you've any love for Beth. I've been insane with grief and fear for Beth and you. Go back to Beth, Henry, at, at once and wait for me. And you? I... I'll set fire to the cabin as soon as I destroy my books. I, I'll join you later. Well, hurry, friend. We'll meet you home as soon as you can make it. For one full hour, I worked feverishly. I soaked the shack in oil, and then taking a taper from the vase, I, I lit the fire. The fire started quickly. I placed my books in the very center of the room, and then opened the door of my shack. The experiment was at an end, and I felt free. The monster's mate would never live. I walked out, and then I saw him, his face contorted with rage. <coughs> my wife! My only dead devil friend! Oh, my only dead! I knew then what was in his mind as he raced through the forest in front of me. The blazing shack was a beacon of light. And I saw his huge, misshapen form outdistance me, far outdistance me. He was faster than I, taller than I, and covered more territory. Racing, running blindly through the forest, I reached my home. The door of my home was flung open. Henry, mutilated and torn, stumbled blindly toward me. Victor. Victor. The monster. Henry, Henry, what? I, I tried to, Victor. I, Henry, you. Beth. Beth, no. Upstairs. Beth! Beth, I'm coming, darling, I'm coming! I'm coming upstairs! <laughs> I'm coming, darling, I'm coming! If you kill her, I'll... Beth! Beth. Beth, oh, my darling. My darling. Oh, Beth, no. No. Both you and Henry. Both dead. <laughs> now, you two are alone, creator. Yes. Both.
both of them were dead. All my dear ones gone from me now. And I'm alone. The wind howling outside my window is my only companion. All else is quiet as I sit by my window writing this document. I am dying of loneliness and fear, shunned by the world, hated by everyone. I know I am waiting only for the monster's return, and he, having eluded the world, will return when I've suffered my full share of misery, as he has suffered his. time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story, Frankenstein. <laughs>